Tonight on The Daily Debrief, one of America's most notorious mob bosses dies shortly after his transfer to a new prison. What happened to James Whitey Bulger? Plus, this child found dead and infested with maggots. Nobody else needed to see this. His father facing murder charges. And this mother pleads to keep her son out of the death chamber. He's always taking full responsibility for murdering this young dentist. That's straight ahead on The Daily Debrief for Tuesday, October 30th. And good evening, everybody. Welcome to The Daily Debrief. The man who for years was second on the list of America's most wanted individuals, right behind Osama bin Laden himself, has died in a federal prison in West Virginia. The Federal Bureau of Prisons says James Whitey Bulger was found unresponsive at 8.20 a.m. They could not resuscitate him, and he subsequently was pronounced dead. No other injuries occurred, but an investigation has commenced. The 89-year-old Bulger was serving a life sentence for racketeering, extortion, conspiracy, money laundering, and a series of weapons charges. Law and Crime Chief Investigative Correspondent Brian Ross is here tonight. Brian, the Bureau of Prisons is saying Whitey Bulger died, but some people are saying he was killed. Well, there are several reports tonight, Aaron, that he was beaten to death by two or three inmates who had a lock in a sock and beat him repeatedly on the face, apparently attempting to gouge his eyes out. For many, this was unexpected that it would happen because they thought the Bureau of Prisons would take better care of a person who for years had been an FBI informant but also corrupted the FBI. I talked with several organized crime figures today in Boston. One said, I'm going to throw a parade. Another said, that's what happens when you become a whitey Bulger. Bulger was a fabled character played in the movies by Johnny Depp and Jack Nicholson. He was a man convicted in connection with at least 11 murders, all organized crime figures or people who dealt with organized crime. He was a person also was considered to have put dozens of mafia figures behind bars. And his lawyer tonight, Hank Brennan, told the Law and Crime Network he's troubled by the fact that they put Bulger into the general population of a prison where there are at least two or three other people from Boston who have been put behind bars by the testimony of FBI informants. It's really surprising to hear that that's exactly how he was treated behind bars, and why was he moved to this new prison? Well, he was told, according to his lawyer, that he was being moved to a medical facility. After all, he's 89 years old. According to the lawyer, he had spent seven months, the last seven months, in solitary confinement in Florida after a fight with a, a guard there. And so that's a question that uh, the Bureau of Prisons will be asked to answer. His lawyer, Hank Brennan, says he doesn't expect to get any answers at all because it's very tough to go up against the Bureau of Prisons. He also told us that Bolger in the last several months had been trying to contact politicians and members of Congress to expose what he called the abuse and corruption by the FBI, perhaps making him a target because he, in fact, claimed to have paid off all kinds of law enforcement agents. In fact, in a documentary in 2014, The United States of America versus Whitey Bolger, he's seen on the documentary talking with his then lawyer, J.W. Carney, about all the law enforcement agents who he did pay off. Everybody I knew I took care of at Christmas time, put money in envelopes for all of the different police. I had contacts on the state police, the Boston police, the uh, ATF, also in the FBI. There was more people than John Connolly, but I'm not going to say who they were. I would never say anybody's name, you know, but I took care of everybody. And was this in cash? And always cash. And not always, yeah. I never had anyone money. I hand them an envelope. Makes it a little bit easier for them to accept it, you know, or I put the money maybe in a box if it was that much money. What was the most was amount of money, of money you ever paid an FBI person, FBI agent? At one time? Yeah. I don't know, maybe 25000 50000 So the body count for Whitey Bulger himself, 12 individuals here. At least convicted of and organized crime figures say there are many more. He would often beat people who he accused of being the informants to cover up his own role as an informant. A lot of layers to this story. Money in envelopes at Christmas time. That's how he described paying off the people he was trying to bribe. A Merry Christmas from what was then known as the Winter Hill Gang. He was one of two people who ran that gang, notorious in Boston. Some treated him almost like a Robin Hood figure, but behind that was some very dirty and ugly and brutal acts. And tonight the table has turned on him. 
you know, as I said, many layers to this story. I know you will continue to follow it as you have. Chief Investigative Correspondent Brian Ross, appreciate the update on the debris. Thank you, Aaron. Opening statements in a horrible case out of Iowa, which left a four-month-old child dead and his own father facing a jury on murder charges. Authorities found the body of infant Sterling Keen rotted and infested with maggots. A medical examiner said the little boy died because his parents simply stopped caring for him. 28-year-old Zachary Keehan faces murder and child neglect charges. A medical examiner said the child died from a failure to provide critical care. The child's mother, Cheyenne Harris, will be tried separately on the same charges. We begin tonight with the prosecution's opening statement. Watch the look on the judge's face as the state describes how the little boy died. This defendant, this father, whose responsibility it was to care for little Sterling, failed in his responsibility. He directly caused Sterling's death. He was left in the same diaper for at least nine, maybe 14 days. He was left in that diaper full of stool, such that it attracted bugs, flies that laid their eggs in that diaper which eggs hatched into maggots while Sterling was alive. And those maggots were in his clothes and in his diaper, feeding on the feces in his diaper. And he laid in that room in that diaper between 9 and 14 days. And the evidence will show that that stool in his diaper irritated his skin, such that it ruptured the skin and his bodily fluids came out. Malnutrition, dehydration, infection caused by diaper ash. That's what caused this child's death. And ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will show that this defendant, the father of that child, is responsible for that death. The defense cautioned jurors not to rush to judgment, then said this was a tragedy, but not a crime. This case is about the death of a child. Nothing anybody says throughout this trial is going to soften that. It's a terrible thing. The problem is, of course, that a tragedy like this creates a gut reaction in us. We want to punish them. There's an automatic tendency to what we refer to as rush to judgment. As jurors, it is your responsibility, it is your job not to do that. This is a tragedy, but not a crime. And we're going to ask you to return a verdict that's not guilty. Defendant himself appeared upset in court as prosecutors played a 911 call where he said his girlfriend checked on the child and found him dead, possibly of sudden infant death syndrome. That's what the defendant said in that call. A first responder then described finding Sterling's lifeless body in a child's swing. He was staring. He had a, his eyes were open and he was a blank stare. His pupils were fixed and dilated. People sh should kind of sometimes move, and his didn't. And he never blinked, he never... And so then you go ahead and you do, you know, your assessment on, on the child. Um, I went down to uh, look, listen, and feel, breathing-wise, basic, basic life support. Uh, he wasn't breathing, checked his brachial brachial pulse. His arm was cold and stiff and he had what appeared to be blood around his on the side of his mouth. My assessment is this this is this is not a baby who I can do CPR on. That witness and a responding police officer testified about the stench and the bugs and how the responding officer recognized the swing in which the dead child was seated. 
first thing that I could smell was human urine. Urine, you said? Yes. Anything else that you can smell? I could smell, um, when I got closer to baby, I could smell, um, I guess the only way to describe it is death. Um, the body has started to, to do what it does when um, they're no longer living. I also, when I was down on baby's level, I could smell um, different, different scents, um, which later turned out to be candles, or uh, like a candle type. I guess, uh, air pressure. The first thing I noticed about the swing was that I, as a parent, had the, had the exact same model, and the swing was left in the on position. Sadly, what prosecutors say happened to Sterling Cohn is not an isolated incident. In 2014, some 1,580 children died as a result of abuse and neglect. That's between about four and five children each day. Some have described child abuse as an epidemic. Every year, 3.6 million referrals are made to child protection agencies. Those referrals involved a total of 6.6 .6 million children. Attorney Allura Nanos, also a law and crime columnist, is with me tonight. Let's talk about that swing that we just heard about, Allura, that the deputy testified that it was on. Okay, why was it on? Are they, are they trying to say that, that this defendant was just so negligent that he left the thing on for weeks as the child died and then the body rotted? Yeah, it sounds like that's exactly what's going on here. Uh, the prosecution seems to be pointing toward a set of facts where this child was left in that swing, I believe they said, between 9 and 14 days. And let's just take a step back for a second. The fact that upon suspecting that his son had died, that this man didn't pick the child up. That is very strange. And the fact that these first responders came and saw the child in the swing, the whole thing just paints a picture of a parent who is totally disengaged. You know, the nurse who was on the stand, she was first to the scene, said she touched the child's clothes and flies came out of the body. But the defense is up there saying, keep an open mind. You haven't heard everything yet. This is not an easy time for the defense, surely, but it was what a lot of lawyers call a non-opening opening. Yeah, I mean, look, this, this defense lawyer, he, there's nothing really that he's going to say that's going to make an incredible impact on this jury because the facts are just that horrific. But the bottom line is he has to serve his client. He has to come up with something to say. And I think it is smart to just say, look, keep an open mind. We're going to try our best. He doesn't really have a whole lot else available to him to say. Yeah, some of the defense uh, facts that have come out thus far are facts regarding care items that were present in the house. You know, could it possibly be a case where each defendant points the finger at the other? It's tough because they were both parents. Allura Nanos, we will check in again with you in just a moment here. To another case now where a Texas jury must decide whether to send a man to the death chamber or to a prison cell for life after already convicting that man of murder charges. Dallas area dentist Kendra Hatcher died in what prosecutors describe as an execution style shooting in September 2015. Authorities say Hatcher was dating this man, Ricardo Paniagua. The problem was his jealous ex-girlfriend, Brenda Delgado. Authorities believe she was the mastermind who hired the defendant, Christopher Love, to rob and kill Kendra Hatcher. Jurors convicted Love last week. Now they are deciding his punishment. Another woman, Crystal Cortez, admitted to being the getaway driver. She pleaded guilty and testified against Love. Defense attorneys are trying to save their client's life. One of their witnesses was the defendant's own mother who took the stand today. He's been spending a lot of time on the phone with me, with Casey, all of us talking to us about he doesn't want us here and embarrassed for something that he did. He's always taken full responsibility for the things that he's done. He hadn't blamed anybody and he doesn't want us to see us go through it. <laughs> Ms. Love, is it, can you find a jury if you impact that uh, his actions had upon your family? It's been devastating. Nobody can get any sleep. Nobody can eat. We've all been trying to be brave for each other, and it's horrible. It's really 
for all the times that Chris has been incarcerated or in jail, I've never heard of him having any problems, anything. He's Chris has always been very respectful. Compare that testimony from the defendant's mother with a witness prosecutors called yesterday. They called the victim's sister. The sister described victim Kendra Hatcher's interest in her new boyfriend and talked about what she missed the most. We talked all the time on the phone, and it wasn't uncommon for her to tell me about a date that she had had, but I never got a lot of detail. It was just I had a date, or, you know, I went to this game, and I talked to this guy. Um, when she met Ricky, it was definitely different, and um, she couldn't wait for us to meet him. And... <sighs> Sorry. Was she, was she planning on bringing him home uh, pretty soon after the... the they were planning a trip to Mexico, and then the following weekend, they were coming home. Is that kind of a big step for, for her and it for y'all? Yeah, we had not met any of, any of her boyfriends, so it was a big step. Uh, did you think this was a, a, a different relationship than had, uh, she had had in the past? It was. She was talking about getting engaged and moving, possibly, um, which Kendra was very independent and... Uh, she wouldn't have discussed that if that wasn't the plan. We miss her a lot. Okay. Yeah. I think when we met, you, you were desperately trying to find a, a video of her laughing. Yeah. <laughs> I just wish she could walk through the room and do it for you because it was so... Just Kendra, she had this laugh. And I think if you asked anybody who knew her, well, one thing they remember most or miss most, it would be her laugh. Alora Nanos is back again with me on the Daily Debrief. Competing narratives here in the penalty phase, Alora, the state with the aggravating factors, the defense hoping that at least one juror latches onto one mitigating factor, perhaps the defendant's own mother. Sympathy here for everyone or sympathy not for the person who pulled the trigger or his family? I think it would be very difficult not to have sympathy for everyone because no matter what a hardened and horrific criminal Christopher Love may be, the fact is his mother is still an innocent victim of his actions to some degree. And I don't think any juror relishes the idea of putting a mother through the idea of executing her child. And at the, at the end of the day, he still is her son. Uh, and, and I think that the defense, while they didn't put on a case here for the guilt phase, you know, they, they're putting on a good case for the punishment phase, and that's really what they have to do. You know, so many questions here about whether jurors should give credit to that mother's testimony. I mean, sure, it's one thing to be empathet empathetic. This might sound harsh. But the bottom line is her son was convicted of pulling the trigger in this plot. This was premeditated. Well, that's certainly true, but I mean, that, that's the job of a juror to really weigh these factors and say, does this case rise to the level of requiring death? You know, let's keep in mind, it's not like they're deciding that he's going to get to walk out on the street. They're, you know, he could go to jail for the rest of his that life. That possibility has been foreclosed. Well, still ahead tonight on The Daily Debrief, jurors appear to be stuck in a murder trial against a state trooper in Michigan, plus a new legal hurdle for the woman who pleaded guilty to lying about being raped by two Connecticut college athletes. We explain when we return on The Daily Debrief. Welcome back, everybody. A Michigan jury today announced it was deadlocked in a murder trial against a former state trooper. Prosecutors say Mark Bessner pulled out his taser and shot an unarmed 15-year-old who was riding an ATV through the streets of Detroit. The victim, Damon Grimes, crashed into a parked pickup truck and died. Bessner testified that Grimes reached for his waistband twice, so he assumed Grimes was going for a gun. Bessner cried on the witness stand and said his decision to use his taser was, quote, terrible, but justified. Now for other incidents making headlines, here is Anthony Velez. Here are today's top crime stories trending on longcrime.com and across the country. An inmate in South Dakota executed for killing a prison guard in 2011 reportedly cracked the joke before receiving his lethal injection. 56-year-old Rodney Burgett, who was sentenced to death for killing 63-year-old Ronald Johnson, a guard at the South Dakota State Penitentiary during a failed prison escape in 2011, allegedly said, sorry for the delay, I got caught in traffic prior to receiving the lethal injection. 
Johnson, who had 24 years on the job, was killed on his 63rd birthday. Forget was previously convicted and sentenced to life in prison for attempted murder and kidnapping. A man in Wisconsin is under arrest after he allegedly broke into the house of missing teen, Jamie Kloss, hours before funeral services for her parents and stole the missing teen's clothes and underwear. 32-year-old Kyle Janky Annis was reportedly caught on surveillance camera entering the home and was immediately arrested by authorities. Janky Annis was cleared by investigators of any involvement in Jamie's disappearance. Investigators say Kloss is considered missing and in danger after finding her parents, 56-year-old James Kloss and 45-year-old Denise Kloss, dead in their home in Barron. Two former Sacred Heart University football players falsely accused of rape by a fellow student have filed a lawsuit against the university and that student. 19-year-old Nikki Yovino accused Damir Bradley and Malik St. Hilaire of rape in 2016 and then admitted to lying to authorities about the alleged sexual assault to gain sympathy from another love interest. Yovino pleaded guilty in August to falsely reporting an incident and interfering with police and is now serving a one-year sentence. Bradley and St. Hilaire, who contend the trice was consensual, are now suing Yovino and Sacred Heart for slander and infliction of emotional distress. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for The Daily Debrief. Back to Laura Nanos now. Laura, let's talk about that last one, Nikki Yovino. Uh, this case attracted a lot of criticism because critics told prosecutors, hey, wait a minute, if you go after her, it will deter true victims from coming forward. That didn't seem logical to me. If somebody lies about something like this and then admits that she lies, shouldn't she also be punished? And she absolutely should be punished. And I don't think it's going to deter anyone. I mean, I think it's already very difficult for people who are victims of sexual assault to come forward. So I don't know that prosecuting someone for lying makes it any more or less difficult. It's already very difficult. And I don't think singling out someone who used the system uh, for purposes of ill rather than for good is, is going to make that any harder on victims. We have just a few seconds left here, but Nikki Ovino's attorney has told me a number of times that she really wants to put this behind her. A civil suit now is going to make that difficult. Yeah, I'm sure she does want to put it behind her, but she should have thought of that before she lied about it. Bluntly put, Allura Nanos, <laughs> law and crime columnist, attorney, appreciate your insights here as always. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, that's all the time we have for today on the Daily Debrief. Many news items happening today. We will wrap them all up for you in this show as we do every day, Monday through Friday. A reminder, of course, that the Law and Crime Network will be streaming many of the trials we discuss beginning tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern. You can find them on lawandcrime.com or on your streaming partners. From all of us at the Law and Crime Network and at the Daily Debrief, have a good evening.